Today, I'm going to make eight-year-old Hattie's Warhammer dream come true. That's me. Hi, I'm Hattie. I'm not eight anymore though, I'm almost 28. But I finally have the time, skill and budget to achieve something I've wanted to do for almost 20 years. You're watching Midwinter Minis. This video has been very kindly sponsored by Dice Goblin, but I'll tell you more about that later. And this is Imric and his dragon. Now, story time. When I was growing up, my brother, Josh, was really into Warhammer. I mean, he's still into it now. Hi Josh, I know you're watching. I used to be fascinated by all the little models he painted, and when he'd go into the Warhammer shop in Peterborough, I'd always stand outside and stare at the spinny displays of cool models in the window, and the big Lord of the Rings battle scenes. We went for a family trip to Warhammer World, probably in 2003 or 2004, and Josh said that I should pick out something I really liked and he would help me make and paint it. I loved Lord of the Rings at the time. I mean, I'm still in love with Legolas. So when I saw all those fantasy elves and dragons, my little mind started ticking. And I thought Imric's big curvy dragon was the coolest Warhammer thing I'd ever seen. We got him. And that was my one and only Warhammer model I had until everything came full circle and I ended up back at Warhammer World, working there on the Warhammer TV team, where I filmed, edited, and released over 400 of their YouTube and Warhammer Plus videos. Josh said I could paint my dragon any colour I wanted. And not to stereotype eight-year-old girl's hair, but I wanted to paint him bubblegum pink. The only thing was, I didn't have the skills or knowledge to paint it how I imagined. I think I gave it half a base coat of tentacle pink from the old black top pots and then gave up. Who'd have thought a massive complicated dragon would be a tricky thing to do for a child's first model? Anyway, life happened and now we fast forward 20 years and I'm gonna give it another go. Try and make eight-year-old Hattie proud and make my childhood dream of Imric riding his bubblegum pink dragon a reality. Now that I have the skills, knowledge and resources to do it justice. So let's take a look at it. What a gorgeous box. I love the old colourful boxes with the saturated colours, the flock terrain in the photos and the big bold paint schemes. Now some people think that you shouldn't open old stuff like this. And as a responsible adult, I can see where you're coming from but eight-year-old me says otherwise. It was only after I got hold of this recently that I discovered that it was a little bit extra cool. It was sculpted by legendary OG Warhammer woman Trish Carden, who specialised in sculpting awesome monsters and beasties. The kit is a mix of plastic and metal pieces, and that's because a plastic kit was originally the Talisman Dragon kit, and was upgraded to be the bigger, nastier looking Imrix Dragon, with some extra metal parts like a new head, claws, and tail to integrate into the plastic kit. Imrix himself is metal too, and is a really nice little detailed model, sculpted by Alex Hedstrom. There was an earlier version of this kit from I think 1994, which was all metal, where Trish sculpted the dragon and Jez Goodwin sculpted Imric. But to be honest, I'm glad I don't have that one because an entirely lead dragon would be ridiculously difficult to build and heavy to work on. Even still, this model in particular is notoriously difficult to build because of the mix of plastic and metal parts that don't really want to stick together and because of the older handmade sculpting process, the parts don't fit together perfectly anyway. I'm going to be honest here, I only really wanted this kit for the dragon. I didn't even know who Imric was. Let's look him up. Prince Imric, renowned as the Lord of Dragons, is the current ruler of the Kingdom of Kalidor, one of the last descendants of Phoenix King Kalidor the Conqueror, and the greatest living dragon prince. My kind of guy. Now, sometimes resin and metal models get slightly squashed in the casting process, and even though he's obviously a very handsome chap from the sides, he looks a bit, uh, strange from the front. It's obviously very rare to find these brand new in the box now, especially the older style of box. We had to absolutely scour eBay for it and wait for the right model to turn up, and they always end up being pretty expensive. This one was £250, which, being realistic, is way more than I'd wanted to spend on a single model. But, thanks to the sponsor of this video, Dice Goblin, I could finally make it happen. As you can probably guess, Dice Goblin make awesome dice for tabletop and roleplay games. They've just launched a brand new Kickstarter for their Misfits and Mayhem dice sets, goblin themed dice with a focus on chaotic characters. One thing that Dice Goblin do really well is making sure all the numbers really pop and are very easy to read. 
Some other dice companies seem to think that the roll result is an afterthought. Naming no names, of course. Each set comes with a character sticker and a dice bag and a free 5th edition D&D goblin-themed mini-campaign. Plus, there are loads of cool sets still to unlock as stretch goals. Follow the link in the description and get it backed! I know that as you're watching a video about a Warhammer mini, you might not actually play D&D, but realistically, you probably know someone who does. And a set or two of these would make the perfect gift for the roleplayer or DM in your life. Also, if you look at the top stretch goal, they want to give every backer a bonus set of D6 dice too. Not to mention the gorgeous little add-ons like Beekeeper Goblin t-shirts and dice tins. So, good luck Dice Goblin! Thanks for helping me actually get hold of this model. Now, let's get it built and painted. Some bits are a little bit wonky, but we'll fix them with a hairdryer and some gentle adjusting. The old metal models often have these little strands hanging off random bits, where the metal followed the air as it vented out of the mould, but they're easy enough to snip off. A gentle scrape with a craft knife to get rid of those pesky mould lines. Ooh, glittery metal fingers. Okay, now into pretty comfy territory, cleaning up plastic bits. Easy mode. Snip snip, scrape scrape, file file. Okay, all the bits, ready to start assembly. I used Tamiya thin plastic cement to attach all the plastic bits together. It's an old kit and I'm seeing quite a few gaps that I'd like to fill. For smaller gaps like on the tummy and the front of the neck, I used sprue goo, which is where you melt some bits of plastic sprue into an old, almost empty pot of that same Tamiya thin plastic cement. It makes a kind of plastic sludge that you can then paint on with a glue brush and then scrape or file flat when it's dry, or smooth out with the actual glue. To attach the metal parts, I used liquid superglue. I think every time we say liquid superglue in a video, we get loads of comments saying that we're dumb because all superglue is liquid. Well, let me introduce you to gel superglue, which is used for porous stuff like wood and pottery. A lot of this process was just sticking, holding on for what seemed like forever, and hoping for the best. I just need the parts to hold on for long enough for me to add some filler around the gaps and to add a bit of strength. Oh, come on. You weren't even a bit that I was worried about. Imric was a bit of a nightmare to put together. The waist connection was really awkward, and it took a lot of reshaping with a hobby knife to get him to sit flush. Anyway, I eventually managed to get everything together, and wow, how cool does that look? Now let's fill those gaps. There might be a better material for this, but I'm most experienced using Milliput, which you'll understand if you watched me entirely cover a great unclean one with the stuff last Halloween. It's a two-part epoxy that when you mix together makes a squishy, moldable material that sets in about an hour, so you've got a bit of working time. You keep it slick and malleable with water, so it's a pretty easy material to work with. When you sit Imric on the dragon, there's a bit of a gap under his butt. So let's fill this spine hole with some milliput and sculpt it to look like a scale. Silicon tools are great for this kind of thing because they don't stick to the milliput. I went around all the parts on the dragon and Imric himself, making sure there were no gaps and that everything was as smooth as possible. Ah, rock solid. It's never gonna fall apart now. Foreshadowing. Please admire my wonderful sculpted details. I tried to follow the creases and patterns on the dragon's body as best as I could with the milliput to make it hopefully not just stay together, but make it have a nice display piece quality when it's done. I let everything dry overnight and came back, picked it up to have a look at it, and... oh, come on now. Fine. You're getting pinned, Imric. I drilled out tiny holes on the waist and arm joints, stuck chopped up bits of paperclip into the holes, and added milliput to the connection points too. This thing is never coming apart again. A few moments later. Time to prime. And to get the best results out of the vibrant pink paints I want to use, I'm going to prime everything white. Now it actually looks like a thing, and all the stuff is the same colour, my sculpting doesn't actually look that bad. A little bit soft, but I can paint on extra details. To kick things off, a mix of white ink and full grim pink to make a very pale pink base coat colour. And I wanted a smooth coat, so I used the airbrush. I'm still not super confident using it, but you only get better with experience, right? It's not a fancy one, just a cheap £20 affair from Amazon. But if you want to try it for yourself, we'll leave a link to this exact one in the description. You'll need a compressor too though, just FYI. I'm going to take this slowly and build things up in subtle layers. For Looper's Pink through the airbrush, focusing on the shadowy parts, edges of the scales and the head. Now a bit of back and forth. 
A tiny, subtle stripe of just white ink down the length of his tummy and neck and into the centre of the wing flaps. And then just full grim pink to act as the mid-tone, smoothing out the transition. I then thinned down all the pinks I just used and then tried to subtly sponge on a bit of skin texture through the transitions. I'm not sure how effective this was, and I actually preferred the way it looked just airbrushed, so until I figure out what to do with the skin on the body, let's paint the wings and ignore all my problems. AK Magenta is an awesome colour. Look how rich it is. Two or three coats to get a nice solid colour. Okay, back to good old Volupus Pink, thinned down with some contrast medium to entirely paint the scales. I then used a Tyranid Flying Hive Tyrant wing, which is surprisingly similar to the old dragon wing, to do a mock-up of what I wanted the wings to look like on my dragon. Our pal Steve gave me some great advice, and as he's won several painting awards, including a Golden Demon, I thought I'd follow his advice. I mixed Vallejo Fluorescent Magenta and AK Magenta together, and glazed it on with an airbrush to soften out the skin texture I sponged on earlier. Now, you might think it pointless mixing two different whites together, but Steve said that mixing in the War Colours transparent white will help it be less chalky through the airbrush, and yeah, it works great to bring back the lightness to the tummy and the underside of the wings. Thin Drucci Violet to the very deep shadows, and any other bits that would catch shade. Now some thinned Volupus pink, yet again, to paint all over the skin on the wing arms to give it some uniformity. Now let's do some highlighting. Vallejo squid pink to paint the underside of all the creases, as that would be where the light would hit them. Now that's done, I can mix Doomfire magenta and Luxion purple together to tone down the wing flappy skin a bit. Thinned loads, just glazing it on, just to make the colour a bit more complex. And then just Luxion purple for the extremes on the wing tips as well as the tail and the little flaps on the head. Back to the magic double magenta mix, and I airbrushed it on the tops of the wings. As I said, this stuff is just loads of back and forth, lots of subtle, mostly transparent layers, which really helps big, organic models look very interesting. Some of the recesses got a little bit flattened with the back and forth, so I revisited the original shading and highlighting colours to touch up a few of the soft ones. I then highlighted most of the body and the tops of the wings with a mix of mostly AK Magenta and Ice Yellow, but don't tell Guy, I was actually using a wet palette to mix the right colours for the different parts of the body. Also, it kept the paints wet enough to work with, as it's been pretty warm the past few weeks, and the studio often reached the high 20s inside. Right, let's paint the horns and the teeth. A base coat of Steel Legion Drab? Sounds simple enough, but this step took bloody ages. I then highlighted them with Baneblade Brown, using a streaky motion up the spines and horns to paint on texture, and then mixed in some ice yellow to make a final highlight colour. Those colours are actually a bit desaturated, and I really want this dragon to pop, so I mixed a sienna wash and an umber wash together and painted this all over the horns, but not the teeth. I don't mind them being quite bright. Back to AK Magenta to add some highlights to the wing arms and fingers. It maybe looked a little bit too chalky, actually, I mixed in some Doomfire Magenta. Yeah, that's a nicer colour. I then did a second highlight by mixing in this bright yellow to the magenta and doing one final touch on the most prominent bits. An extra pop on the light pink bits with a bit of squid pink lightened with white, just for the tiny hand details, the creepy veins near his legs, and his tummy creases. Let's make his eyes look a bit fancy by first base coating with black and then using this awesome Celestial Azure colour shift paint from the Green Stuff world to make it look magically iridescent. Finally, let's highlight the scales. These three paints went on the wet palette to mix the right colours for specific areas on the model, and this bit actually went by quite fast, as I just caught the top two or three edges of each scale. Some Volupus Pink and Drucci Violet to tint the mouth, and then some big rich colours for the tongue too. Okay, that's the dragon pretty much finished. That was my main focus for the video. I know he's a big, special, important boy in Warhammer Fantasy, but Imric himself is honestly a bit of an afterthought. But the dragon wouldn't be finished without him, so let's make him look equally awesome. To be fair, he is a tiny small boy, so hopefully he shouldn't take too long to paint. I primed him white and then base coated his cloak and cape with Xerius purple. Ooh, this paint is quite blobby and transparent. It needed a few coats. Next up, Gamora Lilac to highlight the fabric with sketchy crisscrosses to add some manual texture, 
and a second highlight on the sharpest bits with the Chartla lilac. He looks so pretty! Now let's paint his tassels and other small fabric scarfy bits with AK Blue Violet. A highlight with the Chartla lilac again, and then I mixed in some white to make a second highlight. A very thin glaze of some contrast and wash paints to make a warmer wash to make the colours a bit more cohesive. And then I base coated all of the armour with Vallejo Emilio, uh, Emil Vallejo Al Aluminium. Vallejo Aluminium. And I used a black wash to add some instant shading to the silver bits. Back to the aluminium. Um, no, fuck. Back to the aluminium again for a careful highlight on the silver bits and then some thin druchy violet onto the armour to make it match everything. Maybe it's reflecting the fabric and dragon. That sounds cooler. Some gold detailing using Retributor armour to add some different tones and make it a bit more exciting, and a wash with Agrax Earthshade to tone down those gold bits. A tiny bit of aluminium mixed into the gold to catch a few highlights. And let's paint the skin. White knuckle flesh for the base coat. A mix of shades to make it look a bit more realistic and alive. He's not a zombie elf after all. I then tried my absolute best to catch his eyeballs, which is basically impossible to film yourself, hence why Guy is now holding the camera. I mean, that's not terrible. Let's just shove a bit of Agrax on top to hide the imperfections though. I wanted him to be blonde, just like my dream elf Legolas, so I base coated with khaki, shaded with Agrax, and added some highlights with ice yellow mixed in, and then final touches of just that paint on its own. Some parts I actually want to be just white, so I tidied them up with AK white, and then gem time! There's loads of these all over the model, and it would be cheeky to ignore them, so I added some black armour wash to make a dark ring around their bases, and then painted the gem itself with aluminium, <laughs> aluminium and toned them with thinned Achillean green contrast paint, which is not actually green. I then painted the horn in front of the saddle exactly the same way as the other ones on the dragon's body, and then, to finish the models off, Guy, who did plenty of hobbying in the 90s and is well used to metal models, recommended that I give everything a gloss varnish for extra protection, but then dull it down again with a matte varnish once that was dry to give it a more modern, pro-painted look. Now, what classic Warhammer Fantasy miniature would be complete without a glorious goblin green base? Yeah, I know that was out of fashion in 2003, but that's how I remember all the cool fantasy models when I was a kid. Let a girl dream, will ya? Man, I totally get the appeal of Goblin Green. I've never actually used it before, but its consistency and coverage and really lovely colour, even painting it straight out of the pot is really nice. Let's glue it all together and... Ah, it's actually done! Typically, I'm just looking at all the things I want to change that weren't quite how I imagined. I think it's a bit darker than I wanted it to be. My original aim, though, was to make something that eight-year-old Hattie would be proud of, and I think I've really nailed that. If little me saw this kick-ass pink dragon in a shop window, I would have never stopped looking at it, and I would have wanted to go back and look at it in the shop window every single time we went to town. It was a big challenge to do, as I've said. I've never worked on a model that has so many different parts made from different materials, and it was so fragile. But now it's here, built and painted, and I'm actually really happy with it. Oh, hello everyone, Guy here. Sorry to jump in on Hattie's video, but surely I can't be the only one who's reminded of the flight of dragons by this model, huh? The art by Wayne Anderson has the similar grotesque features and over-the-top proportions. Man, I love that film. It has a really special place in my heart. And I don't know if you noticed, but I've used some of the soundtrack in the background of this video, just in case you thought it was familiar. I really hope you've enjoyed watching me make my childhood Warhammer dream come true. What was the first model that really sparked your interest in the hobby? Let me know in the comments. I'd love to hear from you all. While you do that, I'd quickly like to thank UBD, Glyph, Zero Morphism, and Witch Brigade, our newest Patreon supporters. No joke, this channel simply couldn't exist without the kind support of awesome viewers like them, like you maybe, who decide to sponsor our channel from just £2 a month. It might not seem like a lot, but we honestly couldn't do this without you. If you want to help us out and get some bonus behind the scenes stuff, access to polls to decide future videos, and access to our Discord server, the link is in the description. 
don't forget to check out Dice Goblin's fantastic Kickstarter and start rolling your criticals in style. And I'll catch you next time. Bye for now.